Welcome, podcast listeners. We have a fantastic episode for you today. Last year, when we published The Best Investment Writing, Volume 2, we offered authors the opportunity to record an audio version of their chapter to be released as a segment of the podcast. And listeners loved it. This year, we're bringing you the entire volume of The Best Investment Writing, Volume 3, in podcast format. You'll hear from some of the most respected money managers and investment researchers all over the world. Enough from me. Let's get to our guests and let them take over this special episode. Hi, I'm Rob Arnott, founding chairman of Research Affiliates. We're best known for our work in smart data and asset allocation with about $180 billion in assets managed worldwide using our investment strategies. We're a bit unusual. We're singularly focused on research and product innovation, and we work with distribution partners to make our ideas available to the marketplace. So we deliver solutions in partnership with distribution powerhouses like PIMCO, FTSE, SSGA, BlackRock, Legal in General, Invesco, and Nomura, to name just a few. These firms bring our ideas to their end clients through mutual funds, ETFs, separately managed accounts, and other vehicles. So as one of the pioneers in smart beta, in 2005, we introduced the Research Affiliates Fundamental Index, also known as RAFI, as an alternative to traditional market cap-weighted indexes. The Fundamental Index weights companies based on the size of the business, not based on the popularity of the company, not based on how much the market value is, not based on how extravagantly expensive the company is. So we weight companies based on measures like book value, cash flow, dividends, and sales, thereby severing the link between the price and the weight of a stock in the index. The Achilles heel of cap weighting is that it links the weight directly to the price so that if the price doubles, the weight in the portfolio also doubles. And that means that you are inherently overweight all of the overvalued companies and underweight all of the undervalued companies, even though you can't know which companies are which. RAFI offers a contrarian approach that underweights overvalued stocks and favors out of favor more appropriately valued stocks. As such, it does have a distinct value tilt and it works remarkably well in most market environments in which value is winning, which hasn't been the case in recent years, but boy, value's gotten awfully inexpensive lately. So uh, I think this is an interesting strategy for folks to look at today. We also offer single and multi-factor indexes. We also do a lot of work in asset allocation. To learn more about us and to sign up for our research insights, feel free to check our websites at researchaffiliates.com and RAFI, R-A-F-I, dot com. I've been asked to read you an excerpt from a piece that we published a year ago entitled, Yes, It's a Bubble, So What? I wrote this with my colleague Shane Shepard and with Brad Cornell, Professor Emeritus at Caltech, back in April of 2018, but it still applies today. In fact, we've just written a follow-up article, Bubble, Bubble, Toil, and Trouble, which you can access on our website. Again, the website is researchaffiliates.com. Let's dive right in. The excerpt reads as follows. The relentless rise in the U.S. stock market since its low in 2009 has been dramatic. U.S. stock market valuations now exceed all historical valuation levels, except for those hit at the peak of the dot-com craze. This raises an obvious question for investors. Is the U.S. stock market in another bubble? The answer is yes. The more important question then becomes, how should investors react? We recommend four actions that investors can take in response to current bubble conditions, which should allow investors to benefit from the bubble. What constitutes a bubble? To answer these questions, let's begin by offering a definition of the word bubble. We all hear the word thrown around carelessly and often, but it lacks a formal definition. We define a bubble as a circumstance in which asset prices, one, offer little chance of any positive risk premium relative to bonds or cash using any reasonable projection of expected cash flows, and two, They are sustained because investors believe they can sell the asset to someone else for a higher price tomorrow with little regard for the underlying fundamentals. Notably, there are markets in which few, if any, buyers care about the discounted future cash flows to value an asset. 
1999 to 2000 tech or dot com bubble is the poster child for a broad market bubble. At the height of this bubble, aggressive assumptions were required to believe that the entire U.S. stock market would deliver a positive risk premium relative to then prevailing bond and cash yields. For the tech sector in particular, to deliver a risk premium compared to the 6% bond yields available at that time, most tech stocks would have had to produce rapid growth far into the future, even though few could have succeeded unless their fierce competitors were also struggling. In hindsight, using our simple definition, the tech bubble was indeed a bubble and could have been identified at the time. More importantly, many observers in the midst of the bubble correctly perceived it for what it was. At the beginning of 2000, the 10 largest market cap tech stocks in the United States collectively represented a 25% share of the S&P 500. Microsoft, Cisco, Intel, IBM, AOL, Oracle, Dell, Sun, Qualcomm, and Hewlett Packard didn't live up to the excessively optimistic expectations over the next 18 years. Not a single one beat the market. Five produced positive returns, averaging 3% a year compounded, far lower than the market return, and two failed outright. Of the five that produced negative returns, the average outcome was a loss of 7.2% a year compounded, or 12.5% a year less than the S&P 500. Eerily similar to the new economy dogma of the dot-com bubble is today's cryptocurrency craze. It boggles the imagination to hear people speaking of investing in Bitcoin, an electronic entity that offers no hope of future off operating profits or dividends, is little used as a surrogate for money in transactions, offers an uncertain longer-term use case, and has no objective basis to determine its fundamental value. How many investors are holding cryptocurrencies for any purpose other than the expectation that someone else will pay a higher price at some point in the future? We see a bubble in the US stock market today, albeit less extravagant than the growing swarm of cryptocurrencies. Reasonable observers can disagree, but we believe we are experiencing a tech bubble based on our relatively rigorous definition of the term. At the end of January 2018, the seven largest market cap stocks in the world were all tech flyers, Alphabet, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, and Alibaba. Never before has any sector so dominated the global roster of the largest market cap companies. Now let's focus on how investors should react in response to a bubble. A reasonable first step is to sell or greatly reduce our holdings of bubble-priced assets. The two most dangerous things about a bubble are that, one, markets can go far beyond any objective valuation measure, and two, investors can never know with any confidence when the bubble will pop and the market will turn. Whereas a bubble is not as hard to identify in real time as is commonly perceived, transforming a bubble into a profit, even for investors who correctly discern it, is a tremendous challenge because late stage bubbles can take valuations into the stratosphere. Investors can actually provide their own most appropriate response to a bubble by answering a very simple question. How much shortfall can I tolerate for two consecutive years without panicking? Each investor has a unique threshold for maverick risk, the difference between their manager's performance and the performance of the manager's peers. Above all, whatever bets we take should not be sized to exceed our, our client's tolerance for maverick risk. We recommend four actions an investor can take to protect themselves and even benefit when the bubble eventually bursts. First, an investor can materially reduce or eliminate their exposure to bubble assets. If we cannot construct a reasonable scenario in which the bubble assets could offer an acceptable risk premium, the greater fool rationale, someone will pay more for it later, resembles picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. At a minimum, we can underweight these assets. Second, an investor can seek anti-bubbles in the market and invest in them. Anti-bubbles are sectors or markets priced at levels that cannot plausibly deliver anything but a large risk premium. An anti-bubble cannot exist in a single asset because almost any asset's price can drop to zero. 
but consider junk bonds, financials, and consumer durables in early 2009. These asset classes weren't going to disappear. Each failure of a single company meant that the survivors in that sector had less competition, higher margins, and a clear runway. Collectively, the sector itself couldn't fail to deliver a very large risk premium, barring a handful of genuine Armageddon scenarios. Emerging markets value stocks in early 2016 were a similar example. RAFI, the fundamental index in emerging markets, fell to a Schiller P.E. ratio of 5.6 times earnings, an earnings yield of 18%. In a world of zero-yield bonds and cash, emerging markets' value was an obvious anti-bubble. Similar to the trajectory of a bubble, an anti-bubble continues to collapse until it doesn't, until it turns. Therefore, averaging into our positions with an eye towards not exceeding our investors' tolerance for maverick risk is a prudent way to invest. An anti-bubble can be a rich source of profit for the patient investor. Third, an investor can diversify into investments that are not in bubble territory. For example, as of early 2018, emerging market equities and many developed country stock markets are trading at discounts to their historical valuations rather than the extravagant premium of the S&P 500. As a paper by Arnott, Kolesnik, and Mesterzo entitled Cape Fear noted, many arguments been advanced to justify a Schiller price earnings P.E. ratio also known as a cyclically adjusted PE or CAPE ratio of 33 times. Each of these arguments applies equally to the European and emerging markets, which both sport CAPE ratios less than half as expensive as those in the U.S. market. Other markets offer better places to take on market risk. Seek them out. Fourth, an investor can remember lessons learned from past bubbles such as the collateral damage done to the technology-led cap-weighted indexes. The S&P 500 was savaged in the aftermath of the dot-com bubble, down 23% over the 24 months from March 2000 to March 2002, on its way to an eventual 49% decline just six months later. Today, in the U.S. stock market, value stocks are trading at quite an attractive level, especially in comparison to growth stocks. This is even truer in international markets, and the growth value spread in emerging markets is very near an all-time extreme. If investors significantly reduce equity allocations away from traditional market cap exposures, especially in the United States, and into value-based smart beta strategies, especially in the half-priced European and emerging markets, they are likely to enjoy significant insulation against the next eventual but inevitable market downturn. One final note, I'd love to see us transform the industry from a fixation on past returns and performance chasing to a focus on forward-looking returns and a willingness to buy whatever is newly cheap. Our AAI, Asset Allocation Interactive, and SBI, Smart Beta Interactive websites are free are intent on exactly this focus and give people an interactive way to explore their investment options. Check them out at researchaffiliates.com slash AAI and researchaffiliates.com slash SBI. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed this webcast.